All right, there was one question in the chat that I just want to let everyone know. Uh, if you do want to rename yourself just so we can check you in, uh, if you're on a computer, what you need to do is you hover over yourself with your mouse and there's three little dots there. And then when you click on that, there'll be one of the cues that says rename and you'll be able to type in what your name is. Uh, if you're on an iPad, unfortunately, I'm not as tech savvy as it is. I don't know exactly how to do that. Um, so feel free uh, to don't worry about that. Uh, but it looks like we're coming right on time right now. Um, it looks like we have everyone that's going to be able to join right at the start of the hour. So we'll be able to start our presentation right now. Um, my name is Matt Lacerdo again. I'm the Director of Affinity and Domestic Engagement here at Northeastern, and we're very excited about this program. Uh, so thank you so much for being able to join us. Um, what we'll be able to do during this is we ask everyone to stay on mute during this just so we don't have any background noise. So if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to make sure to add that to the chat function. We'll be able to get that over to the professor. Um, and with that, I know you don't really want to hear from me, um, but I do want to let you know that this will be recorded. Uh, so if there's any point you miss anything, this will be up live on our YouTube channel uh, in the next couple of days. So I would probably say sometime around Monday uh, is usually a good time for that to happen. Um, with that, I'm going to start right over and do an introduction quickly of our professor. Uh, Patrick Mullen is the author of The Poor Beggar's Tool, Irish Modernism, Queer Labor, and Postcolonial uh, History, uh, which is soon to be released on paperback. He has also written articles with Edith Wharton, um, James Joyce, and Rogers Kasnett uh, that appeared in a novel, Critical Quarterly, and Public Culture. He teaches courses in the areas of modernism, uh, the history of the novel, critical theory, queer theory, Irish studies, and film. He regularly leads one of the Northeastern Summer Dialogues of Civilization to Ireland that focuses on Irish literature and cinema. Uh, he was a fellow uh, with the National Endowment uh, for the Humanities Summer Seminar in 2012 on James Joyce's Ulysses at Trinity College, right in Dublin. Uh, he is currently serves on the editorial board for Signs, uh, and he is working on a manuscript uh, that addresses representation of managers and management in the modernist fiction. Um, that is a quick introduction. I know he has a lot more things that he's been doing, um, but I will say this, if you want, feel free to put the view in speaker mode uh, so you actually be able to see um, Patrick in full force um, for the presentation. And we'll start the presentation right now. Uh, Professor Mullen, feel free to take it over. Um, well, hello, everybody. Oops, there goes my thing. Hello, everybody. Um, it's so great to be here and happy Blooms Day. Um, as uh, Matt said, I'm uh, Professor Patrick Mullen. Feel free to call me Patrick if you have questions. Um, I've been at Northeastern since 2005, um, and I was looking across all the names there to see if any of my ex-students were in there. Um, and I'm not quite sure if anyone is or not, but if you are, certainly say hi. Um, as Matt was saying, I, I, um, two of my areas of specialty are Irish studies, um, and particularly the work of James Joyce. Um, so uh, 2022 is actually the centenary of um, the release of uh, Ulysses. He um, it was first released on his birthday um, in 1922. And um, <clears throat> so there's all sorts of things going on uh, for the kind of like anniversary of that next year. Um, and I'm actually delighted to say that I'm in a collection, Cambridge University put out, is putting out a collection on um, the new Joyce studies for the new millennium. And I have um, a short contribution to that. So Joyce is very much in my wheelhouse and I'm delighted to be here to introduce you to him. So. Um, I thought that what I would do first is <clears throat> just start with some basics. Um, and uh, the way I have it organized is I have about 15 to 20 minutes of chat um, to kind of give you some idea of who Joyce was, what is Bloomsday, what is Ulysses, um, why are people interested in reading him, why, why does he seem to have such staying power. Um, and then the second part, uh, I have some, um, audio, some media for you. So I have some, um, I have some, uh, some images I'd like to share with you and some audio. Um, and actually before I forget, um, I went ahead and posted in the chat um, and Matt might be able to repost it in case it's not there. Um, if you're interested in reading Ulysses, um, either for the first time or maybe you read it as like um, an undergrad and you wanna like have another go at it, um, I put some links in the chat for you that would be very helpful for, um, for that project. Um, and the first is actually a fabulous online guide to Ulysses um, that came out of a couple years ago. Um, I forget the person's last name, but I'm pretty sure his first name's Patrick. I wonder why I would remember that. 
Um, but uh, it's an online guide to uh, Ulysses. It's fantastic. It bra it's, it's in very kind of accessible language. Um, both describes like why scholars are interested in it, but also describes how regular readers might be interested in it and what they might do with it. Um, and it takes you through each of the episodes um, and talks about all sorts of things. It's a fantastic guide. That's the first link. Um, the next link is, strangely enough, um, Ulysses, it's a complicated work, like I'm not gonna lie to you, so that if you're interested in um, taking on Ulysses, uh, maybe it's a bucket list thing, maybe you've always wanted to do it. Um, I'm not gonna tell you that it's gonna be easy to start, it's gonna be difficult, but it's very doable. Um, and it's very doable on your own, or um, with a collection of people who are also novices and trying it out, or there's all sorts of Joyce groups that um, invite novices in um, to kind of let them learn the ropes. Um, but one of the interesting things about it is that whereas it's kind of a challenge to read, it can be very easy to listen to. Joyce was a singer himself, he loved music. Um, there's a whole soundscape to Ulysses um, where it's kind of flooded with um, references to opera, references with uh, references to popular culture and popular songs. Um, and so listening to it is actually really fantastic. And I put a link for an audio version that was put out many years ago, and it's just fabulous to listen to. Um, the next links are, if you're wondering what version to buy, um, I would say buy the Gabler version. There's all sorts of various versions that have been out. As I said, the first version that came out of Ulysses um, was in 1922, so 100 years ago almost. Um, Joyce is very eager, he was keen to have it come out on his birthday. Uh, and so he kind of rushed it to the publishers in France. Um, and there you had all these Frenchmen running the printing presses um, whose English wasn't their first language. And Joyce was such an experimental writer. He kind of did away with parentheses or, or it's quotation marks. He had kind of novel words that he invented. He had like um, in the final chapter, it's about 30 pages long and it's six sentences with only six periods in it. So it's, it's a real challenge. And a lot of these printers kind of helped correct it rather than kind of accept the experimentation that it was. So the 1922 version is actually not as up to date as kind of later versions where scholars have gone back and looked at what Joyce wanted to add in. And Joyce himself, he was, he was a bit of a prima donna so that even when that first version came out, he immediately thought, you know what, I'm gonna add this, I'm gonna add that, I'd like this to do that, I'd like that to do that. So there's all sorts of versions out there, which is great fun, but um, a kind of, uh, kind of a, a version that kind of does the work of combing through that for you is the Gabler edition. So I have that um, listed for you. Uh, and finally, just so that you'd be able to follow along today when we're listening to the audio version, because at the end I want us to listen to a couple snippets of that, um, I have the Project Gutenberg edition um, which is an online edition, edition um, that just collects um, open access works um, of, from, of literature from around the world. But I have that link in case you'd like to read it or, or read along while we listen. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump into my presentation. And as I said, it's about 15, 20 minutes long. Um, and if you have a question, please feel free to kind of um, post it in the chat. And maybe we'll take like a bit of a, a breather in the middle here. Um, and see, see if people have questions that I can kind of answer on the spot. Um, so the first thing, today's Bloomsday. Who is James Joyce? What is Ulysses? Um, <clears throat> so Joyce was born in Dublin in 1882 and died in Zurich, Switzerland in 1941. Um, and that, that route of, being of a writer being born in Ireland but um, traveling to Europe um, is one that a lot of writers, Irish writers in particular, followed. Ireland was part of the British Empire um, and so writers felt that they needed to leave Dublin in a certain sense, leave Ireland. Most of them made their way to London actually um, and kind of made their fame and fortune there. So we think of say Oscar Wilde or W.B. Yeats or George Bernard Shaw. They all kind of went to the, the center of the empire to London to kind of um, to make their careers. Joyce did something slightly different in, he did see London um, but he went from London first to Paris um, and then was more continental than he was um, in the UK. Uh, and so um, that's an interesting kind of feature about him. I would say that if you're, if you're wondering why Joyce is so interesting, I, I, like, I'm happy to have a debate about this, but I would say that he's the most influential English language novelist um, from the 20th century. Um, he was writing at an era um, that was known as the modernist era 
Um, this, and it's not that everyone writing or working, all the artists working in this period, necessarily call themselves modernists, but very quickly scholars and critics called them kind of the modernist movement. And it was a name to describe the really innovative and sort of revolutionary work that was being created in all sorts of fields at the time. Um, I mean, actually, I, I don't have it listed in my notes here, but um, Einstein is frequently looked at as a kind of modernist, kind of um, renovating what we think about as physics. Um, Freud actually is a modernist in many ways, um, kind of renovating and innovating the way that we think about the human psyche. Um, and then there were other writers, say Virginia Woolf um, or T.S. Eliot or Langston Hughes. Um, in, the, in the field of painting, we have people like Picasso or Georgia O'Keeffe who are really kind of creating new forms and new ways of expressing um, ideas and feelings and emotion and thought um, in whatever medium it is that they're working in. You have modernism in the world of music, so Stravinsky and Bartok, um, and then even modernism in the world of architecture, whose names I don't have listed, and um, my husband's an architect, so he won't like that I can't name them, but um, Lefebvre, I think he is a modernist. Um, and then even in the world of sculpture, so Rodin, um, Henry Moore, Barbara Hepworth. Um, now, Joyce is primarily known for four works in particular. Um, I'm gonna talk about the three of them, and I'll leave aside Finnegan's Wake, which is his last work, and is, is one of my favorite books, so I'm very happy to address the wake in, um, in the, the Q&A. Um, Finnegan's Wake, it, it's, it's mad. He, he, he says that he writes it in the language of the night, and it's kind of in this dreamscape language where you sort of think that it's in English, and you sort of know what's going on, but you sort of don't know what's going on. Um, and he compacts something like 66 um, languages into English um, so that it, it has this interesting resonance to it. It's fabulous. I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but for today, um, we'll stick with the first three, um, and particularly the first, uh, the, and Ulysses in particular comes out of the work that he's doing in the earlier things. So it's worth taking a moment to think about what's going on there. Um, so Joyce's first publication is Dubliners, um, which is a collection of short stories. And this, is, this always knocks the socks off students. Do people say that anymore? Um, but this, uh, this is always kind of fascinating for students when they're you know, 18, 19, 20 in my class. Um, but this collection of short stories, which really changed the form of the short story, um, innovated it so much that it, it left its mark even till today. He wrote it when he was in his early 20s. Um, now it took him about 10 years to actually get these short stories published. Um, and a lot of that is, um, in a certain sense, publishers looked at that and publishers also looked at Ulysses and Joyce is a modernist. So he's into the modern ideas. He's into modern ideas of sexuality, of women, of gender, of thinking. Um, he's against too many traditions, etc. And so he had a hard time with publishers and um, publishers were kind of shocked and scandalized by things that might not shock or scandalize us today in Dubliners. So it took him a long time to get it published. And Ulysses actually is a work um, when it first made it to the States, it um, was involved in obscenity trials. And some of these obscenity trials that happened around Ulysses actually helped set and shape the law for how we think about obscenity and publishing um, to this day in the States. So it was actually kind of um, landmark legal work that was happening around it. Um, and actually thinking about that kind of difficulty for Joyce, that here he is, he's innovative, he's doing something new, he's thinking new thoughts, he's very brave. So he's, here he is in a very kind of Catholic conservative country and he's thinking about love and sexuality and women and people's desires and their roles in the world beyond um, the doctrinaire and beyond kind of dogma. Um, so he's very innovative. And in a certain sense, he's not recognized by publishers. He's not recognized by editors. They don't get what he's doing. And so that marks him. So he imagines himself, he's both frustrated by that and he's also kind of um, spurred on by that, thinking like, well, I've, I'll show them, I'll show them. Um, and in the same sense, that sense of like, on the one hand, they ignore him, but on the other hand, he causes such a uh, kind of fury of um, publicity. Um, it actually helps make him very famous so that Joyce ends up being a modernist um, who's a household name, who people know, who people, even if they've not read it. I mean, think about um, that photo of, there's a very famous photo, and I don't know why I didn't have it in our 
my photo collection for later, but of Marilyn Monroe with Ulysses. So that sense of like movie stars know about Ulysses. Part of that comes from the fame and the infamy of these sort of trials that took place around his works. Um, so back to Dubliners Inn, on the surface, they seem like very realistic stories about the difficulties of life in Dublin, which is at the time a pretty poor city in many ways, um, and a city with a very complicated history. Um, a city that, um, it's the second city in the empire, but imagine that, you're the second city in someone else's empire, and imagine all of the frustration around that. There's both, there can be a sense of pride that you're the second city, but also that sense of why aren't we the first city in our own nation. Um, and so Joyce says that Dublin at the time was gripped by paralysis. Paralysis is the word that he used to talk about the people of Dublin, the culture of Dublin. Um, and it's interesting when students read these for the first time, a lot of times their reaction is, what is going on here? That is to say, there seems to be so little, so nothing, like that there's barely a plot. These aren't stories about bank robberies. These are stories about someone said something or someone went to a fair and bought something. Um, someone kind of went to a dinner party. There's not much that seems that's going on with them at first, but the more that you stick with them, the more that you come back to them, the more you think about what's he doing with language here? What, what are those ellipses? What, what is not being said in this sentence that I imagine might be being said? And you realize that Joyce has this genius for hearing behind the innocuous, behind the empty things of the everyday, and he sends us, oh wait, something's going on. And he'll call this in Dubliners um, an eye for epiphany. So that moment of in the everyday, suddenly there's an illumination. Suddenly there's something that happens that makes it all make sense and makes connections in ways that you hadn't expected before. Um, and even though it's a very experimental way of writing, I think Joyce is also always very connected to people, to readers. And so I think all of us, for, for instance, can think of maybe a conversation maybe a particular moment at work, maybe a particular moment with family, where for the outsider, you would hear, oh, wow, this is just a very regular conversation. Nothing's going on here. But it, in fact, for you, if you're involved and you know the histories and you hear the words that people are using, that you can sort of say, no, this is very important. There's so much going on here. There's so much coming together in this seeming little phrase. Um, and that's, that's really the sort of thing that Joyce has an ear for, in, um, in Dubliners and actually in all of his work. His next work then that is famous uh, and important for our, for our work today is The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. It comes out in 1916. Um, this is actually a very revolutionary time in Ireland. Um, so when Joyce is writing Ulysses, when uh, The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man is coming out, we can go into the Irish history if you'd like. Um, but Ireland, as I said, was part of the British Empire. There's a kind of growing nationalist movement. It starts as a very cultural movement. It ends up becoming a political movement. Um, and in 1916, there's this thing called the Easter Rising. Um, and uh, there's a kind of armed insurrection against the British presence. Um, it leads to a very complicated history after that. There's a war for independence. There's a very bloody civil war in Ireland. Um, then there's the establishment of an Irish state and eventually an Irish Republic. So it's a very kind of politically complicated time for Ireland. Um, now, when Joyce uh, is writing the portrait though, he tells the story of how he became an artist. Um, and, and this is important. For, for Joyce, Ireland was very claustrophobic. Um, as I said, it was part of the British Empire and Joyce disliked the jingoism and aggression of imperialism. Um, so Joyce also disliked though, um, as the kind of Irish kind of rose up to counter uh, in a kind of anti-colonial way, um, the kind of British presence, they kind of defined Irish nationalism as being as simply anti-English, as what the British weren't is what the Irish were going to be. And actually Joyce found that claustrophobic too. And so he found that aggressive and jingoistic. So he wasn't into that. Um, the next thing is, as I kind of mentioned in passing, the Catholic church had an enormous influence in Ireland at the time. And Joyce, um, thought very seriously about becoming a priest, but he also eventually rejected that. So Catholicism was too restricted. So it rejected and shamed people for sexual desires. And young Joyce was increasingly into this idea of a free modern sexuality. And that, that's gonna play a very big role in, in Ulysses. Um, the church was also too domineering of women. 
And Joyce was a great advocate for the new modern woman. Um, and so even in, in Ulysses, this model of Molly, who's one of the kind of main characters that's um, vaguely modeled on Nora, um, his partner and eventually his wife, um, and this idea of an independent woman who can do her own thing, who doesn't have to follow tradition or social norms and can think her own thoughts in the world. Joyce is very into that. <clears throat> and he found the church too restrictive in that sense. Um, now the church was also too aggressive for Joyce. Um, th so the, there's a very famous story in the beginning of, um, <clears throat> in the beginning of the portrait where um, a grade school Joyce is punished and it's an unfair punishment and his, they strike him on the hands. And um, he appeals this and the appeal is unsuccessful. And that sticks with him his whole life, this sense of injustice, this sense of a violent kind of, um, kind of violent retribution for something that's happened that he hasn't done. And so Joyce sees in this <clears throat> some dedication to, to aggression, to violence, and not to justice. And so Joyce um, finds himself troubled by Catholicism. Um, so Joyce then, at the end of um, the portrait, as he's kind of, he tries out in the, in the novel, all these different kind of what's available to him um, in terms of his whole worldview in Ireland. And he decides at the end that he has to, the, the quote that he uses is, he has to fly by the nets of nationality, language, and religion. So none of those, neither, the Ireland is not, Irish nationalism is not going to be a home for him. Catholicism is not going to be a home for him. And so he leaves all of this. And instead of going to London, as many Irish writers had done, he goes to Paris. Um, and there in Paris, on the one hand, he's meant to study medicine, but he's really there to become an artist, to become a writer. Um, now, excuse me. So Ulysses, this brings us to Ulysses, and you'll see why shortly um, I started with Dubliners and the portrait. So Ulysses was first published on his birthday in February 2nd, 1922. And it actually grew out of Dubliners. So it was going to be one of the stories in the collection. But this particular story took on a life of its own. Um, and so it's, it is very much a story of the everyday, but um, it became not a story just of the everyday, but of this one super abundant day, June 16th, 1904. Um, and it, if, if in a certain sense, there's, um, there's a way that many of the stories in Dubliners are sparse. That is to say, not much seems to happen and you just get a word here, a word there, and all this suggestiveness is the way it operates. Um, Ulysses is a very abundant novel. That is to say that it takes um, a handful of characters in one day and kind of tries to see what happens in that day, both in their characters' minds and their actions and their interactions, how those kind of little local things um, while on the surface we might not think of them as connected to the history of literature, to the history of humankind, to human civilization, Joyce shows how they are. So it's a very abundant novel. And anytime there's a moment for Joyce to kind of put more in rather than take out, in Ulysses he tends to put more in. Um, now the first thing uh, to say about the novel though is that it's actually kind of a love letter. Um, in that it describes the day that Joyce and the love of his life and um, eventual wife, Nora Barn Barnacle, had their first date and they went out walking in Dublin. Um, now it doesn't recount that story exactly. So it doesn't tell its love story in a particularly sentimental way. Um, though in a certain sense, as sharp as Joyce was, like Joyce, Joyce is, he's a modernist, so he's throwing off the kind of the chains of sentimentality. Um, but he's a bit of a softy too, so that there is a way that Joyce loved popular sentiments. So he loves cheesy, he would love cheesy pop songs from today. He himself was a singer, so he's a very musical person. Um, and he loves popular music. He loves um, opera. He loves the dramatic um, emotions that come with opera, the melodramatic emotions that come up with opera. So there's, al there's always a way that like Joyce in a certain sense inoculates himself against being too taken away um, by the sentimental and by emotion, by kind of um, by kind of taking on the mantle of the great artist, but at the same time he's a softy, and there's all sorts of places in Ulysses where you realize like, oh, Joyce just really likes this silly song, or Joyce really just likes this silly little poem, and he just enjoys it. 
Um, and th th there's a moment where um, famously it was said about Joyce that he never met a boring person. Um, and so there's this sense about him that um, he loved people and whoever you were from whatever walk of life you were, he'd find some interesting way to chat, to chat with you. He's very outgoing. He would find a way to chat with you and find something about your life that he found of interest, et cetera, et cetera. So he, he has that kind of softer side to him too. But that said, this is not a particularly, um, this is not a particularly sentimental love story that we get in Ulysses. Um, so Ulysses is a story that have three central characters. Um, the first is a married couple. So we have Leopold Bloom, a Jewish advertising salesman, and Molly Bloom, a singer. Um, then we have Stephen Dedalus, who is a representation of the young joys. And Stephen Dedalus is the same character that was in um, that was in the portrait of the artist. Um, and so when he sets out to the, at the end of the portrait of the artist, he's very ambitious. He says, I'm going to forge in the smithy of my soul, the uncreated conscience of my race, big ambitions. Um, and there's, a, there's actually a fun story about Joyce. Like he, he was, he had big ambitions. Like he had no sense that he was going to fail. Um, but he, a young Joyce meets Yates when he's in London on his way to Paris. And, um, Yates has heard about him, he's interested in him. And so he's read some of his poetry and he, he's gonna tell him some things. Um, and Yates at this time, Yates is, uh, he is also Irish, Anglo-Irish. And he basically is the most important poet in the English language. Like he is, um, he's a kind of writer of great stature and fame, et cetera. Um, Joyce meets with him and Yates kind of has some complaints or kind of critiques of some of his poems. And Joyce says to him something like, how old are you? And Yates lets him know. I think Joyce is in his early 20s. Yates might have been in his 40s. And um, Joyce says, oh, I see. It's too late for you. I can teach you nothing. And like the meeting ends and he goes off. So there's no sense that like Joyce um, was, like, was, he's not like a wallflower. He very much has big ambitions. Um, and so it's those big ambitions that fuel these very kind of beautiful but dramatic kind of things at the end of the portrait. Um, where he's going off to kind of become the national writer. Well, lo and behold, he returns to Dublin and we find him at the start of Ulysses, a kind of failure, um, or at least a young person who has all those ambitions, who's not achieved all that he set out to achieve. He's about 22, he's dropped out of medical school, his mother has died and that drives him home. He actually, during this trip, only spends about four or five months in Paris. Um, and when he arrives in Dub Dublin, He's not feted, he's not lauded, he's not welcomed. He finds himself sidelined by the writers of the national literary scene. Um, and so Stephen is, like the kids today might say, he's kind of emo. He's kind of an emotional kid, an artsy kid, who's a bit of a failure, hasn't lived up to things. He's a bit depressed, he's poor. So a lot of, Dub <clears throat> a lot of Ulysses actually has, Stephen doesn't eat very much. And it's not clear that he has a regular source of income that provides him with pretty regular food. Instead, he gets paid, uh, he kind of lives hand to mouth. And when he gets paid, he tends to spend his money on drink rather than food, which is what happens uh, in Ulysses. He's also not getting along with his friends. He's a bit jealous of them. They're kind of, <clears throat> they're hopeful for him, but they also kind of recognize in him a certain kind of disappointment. Um, and also they're kind of, get, they're getting invited to the sort of literary events that he's not getting invited to. Um, and he's not writing they know it and they tell him that he's not writing the kind of poetry that he wants to write that would make him a famous literary figure that he wants to be. Um, so Stephen's not in great shape <clears throat> at the beginning of the novel. Now things are not much better for Bloom. He is 38. Um, he's had one son die at a very young age, Rudy. Um, his daughter, uh, she's in her mid-teens. She's starting to become a woman. Um, and there might be some sense that she's going out with the boys too much. And so she's been sent off to Mullingar, to the middle of Ireland, um, where she can kind of have a quieter summer at this point. Um, he's very well known in Dublin, but he's certainly not treated very well. So that, um, even as he's a very generous figure, we know that he helps people out when they're in a, in a bind, he lends people money, he does favors for people, um, but people are still willing to make um, jokes about him, to kind of say bad things about him to his face almost, and then be corrected. So he, he's not very well treated by people. And to top it all off, his wife is having an affair with her manager, Blazes Boylan. 
Um, now, not only is she having an affair, but the whole town knows it. Um, and Bloom knows it. And Bloom even knows that on this particular date um, that Blazes is calling over to the house at four and they're planning a torrid afternoon encounter. Um, so that Bloom passes his entire day and you see this through the novel that he'll be doing one thing and suddenly something will remind him of what's going on, will remind him of what Molly's up to, will remind him that everybody knows what Molly is up to, that people will accidentally say something and realize that they've made a kind of inappropriate joke and then they'll kind of nudge each other in the ribs and go with it. So he, he knows it, the whole town knows it, everybody knows that everybody knows it. Um, and the novel is, is kind of one of the very, very kind of sensitive parts of the novel is the way that Joyce is able to portray this person who is in his core is kind, is considerate, is thoughtful, is curious in the world. He has a weird kind of, he, he would have loved Wikipedia. He has a kind of weird Wikipedia take on the science of the world, but also he's racked by anxiety that he knows something is going on that he doesn't want to be going on, but he has to kind of accept it because he also has to accept Molly because he still loves Molly and Molly is deciding that she wants to do this. Um, now, Stephen starts his day with his roommates in a Martello Tower. And the Martello Tower was a series of forts built along the Irish coast by the Brits to protect against Napoleon and the threat of invasion. Um, and actually, they're very beautiful. They're, there's Many of them are still there if you've had the chance to visit the coast of Ireland. Um, Stephen's having a pretty bland day. He goes to work and gets paid. He meets up with people at the National Library. Uh, he recounts for them his kind of fantabulous theory of Shakespeare, which is dramatic and interesting and convoluted and, um, and exciting. And he gets a bit of attention for it, but he also is kind of ignored for it. And then he decides to go off drinking. He actually skips an appointment. He's meant to meet his roommates, skips out on them, gets caught up in drinking with another bunch, ends up meeting up with them, uh, with the original bunch and drinking with them. Um, as it is, this is this is kind of they're rowdy teenagers, and this is the kind of life in Dublin at the turn of the century. They actually end up going off to the red light district. They end up going off to a brothel, um, and his night ends. A very drunken Stephen ends as they're kind of leaving the brothel and leaving Night Town. It's called, and he's punched in the face by an angry, drunken British soldier. Now, Bloom starts his day at a funeral. Then crisscrosses the city on a series of errands, um, the whole time weighted down by the knowledge of what Molly's up to. Um, Bloom actually runs into Stephen's father at different moments. Stephen's father is, <clears throat> in a certain sense, um, we know that um, Joyce had a certain respect. Joyce was very connected to his family and it affected him very much. He had a certain respect to his father because his father was a great wit. His father told hilarious stories and um, was articulate and sharp and just had lines that Joyce stitched into Ulysses. At the same time, his father was a bit of a lout. Um, he drank all the family fortune. They kind of went from a vaguely middle-class status to lower and lower and lower status as the father drank his kind of fortune away. And they kind of were running away from landlords and moving all over Dublin. Um, his mother, uh, Stephen has a very kind of complicated relationship with his mother. Um, on the one hand, we have Joyce um, very much kind of promoting and acting as a kind of um, as a kind of defender, as an advocate for women. Um, but his mother is a complicated figure. He comes home from Paris. She's a very religious figure, and there on her deathbed, she's dying of cancer, and she wants him to um, take communion uh, and uh, to take communion and to do this act of faith, and he refuses even on her deathbed. Because um, he sees that he can't, um, he can't do religion like that. Um, and so that haunts him. And in the novel, it haunts him. So it, it, Stephen very much has a kind of depression in the novel that he doesn't quite know how to get over yet. That kind of like, that his mother appears as a ghost and haunts him in the novel. Um, now, so we have Bloom, he's uh, gone to a funeral, he's run errands all day. We see him kind of elbowed and talked down to by the people of Dublin, even as they kind of know him. Um, we see him run into Stephen's father. Um, at the beginning of the novel, they're kind of separated. Eventually their paths cross. And Bloom, who does not drink to excess, so Bloom is 
he's had a couple drinks throughout the day, um, but he's not, he's not half as drunk as Stephen. He follows him into the brothel to look after him. And as a kind of pseudo father for this distressed young man, um, he takes care of him. He tries to stop the incident with the soldier, takes care of him afterwards, takes him home and makes him cocoa. Um, then there's a moment where he asks Stephen if he wants to crash, uh, but Stephen, Stephen feels that he's feeling better. Um, then Bloom climbs into bed with Molly. He actually sleeps upsidey downy, so it's like they sleep head to toe this particular evening. Um, and then the final bit of the book, and that's it. That that's kind of the the kind of if there's a plot, that's the plot of of the majority of the book, um, and certainly the plot of the day for Stephen and for Bloom, for Leopold. Um, the final bit then is Molly, and Molly, who's been in bed all day. Um, she's kind of been waiting for Boylan, has Boylan arrive, has her kind of affair with him, he's off. And at the end of the novel, she reviews her day and she reviews her affair, she reviews her life, uh, she reviews herself and Bloom and her youth. Excuse me. <clears throat> and she decides in the very famous bit, and we'll get to listen to this um, during the audio section, she decides that she does love Bloom and that for all of his shortcomings, and she admits she's never been perfect either, but for all his shortcomings, she loves him and she loves her life and she loves all of the strange, wonderful things that his, uh, the life offers her. Um, so while Ulysses, in a certain sense, like I've, I've recounted a lot of misery, you might be wondering why you showed up to this Bloomsday presentation to hear, um, to hear such a list of misery um, enumerated for you. Um, but while Ulysses does have these sad moments and it has moments of pain and suffering, and some of them, some of them are very moving. So moments where say, um, Stephen is thinking about his mother and on her deathbed, moments of where say Bloom is thinking about his son Rudy and what, what it would have been like if Rudy had lived. Um, so that there is a lot of pain, but it really is a wonderful novel. It's full of life and humor. And Joyce is such a lover of language and comedy and humanity that ultimately, even in, um, even in this world of kind of pain, it is that kind of um, Courboisier, that's, yeah, that is the um, modernist architect. Uh, <clears throat> even in this world of pain, it's the comedy. Like Joyce is ultimately a comic writer. Um, so that is me talking. Um, so uh, what, what if we took, should we take a moment and maybe work through some of the questions? And then I have some fun kind of like, video and audio and images to show you. Um, Patrick, it looks like there was one question that was put in the chat. Um, it was, is Bloom disrespected and treated badly because he was Jewish? Yes. Um, and so uh, apparently um, the decision to kind of put Bloom, to make Bloom the kind of main character of his novel, Jewish, um, has some kind of connection for Joyce in history. That there was a moment where Joyce himself as a young man was drunk and found himself clobbered by somebody that maybe he was mouthing off to. Um, and it was a kind kind of Jewish man who helped him um, and took care of him after that. Um, and it's interesting, when, when Joyce started the novel, Stephen was the main character. Um, Stephen, who's come from Portrait, now come back to, to Ireland. But then as it got going, Joyce uh, tells friends, uh, kind of artist friends that he's working with that he's done with Stephen, that Stephen can go no farther, and that the character he's really interested in is Bloom. Um, that, uh, and it's that he sees Bloom as an all around character. He, he sees in Bloom's Jewishness um, a kind of antidote, a kind of like inclusive antidote um, to the kind of way that Irish nationalism was defining itself. So that like you had kind of like British imperialism that kind of had an image of here we are, here were the Brits we're rational, we're calculated, we're successful, we're all of these sort of things. Um, the Irish, you're not as successful as us, you're, you're spiritual and irrational and you need us in running things for you. The Irish then when they rise up, say no, we're, this is what the Irish are like, we're, we're, we're spiritual and special and magical and unique and, and everything that the British aren't. But it's, they also still had a very kind of, um, aggressive way of delimiting who was Irish, who wasn't Irish, what you had to do to be Irish. And, um, and, and Joyce saw in this figure of Bloom um, a way of counteracting that, that the Jew in Europe 
never quite fit in and the Jew in Ireland didn't quite fit in. And that kind of sensitive, like Bloom has a famous moment where he says, uh, he's in a kind of, um, he's in a kind of debate with this very kind of aggressive, slightly drunk uh, person in a bar who is pretty anti-Semitic and anti-English and pro-Irish. And he's enraged with Bloom. And he says, what country is you, what's your nation? And Bloom says, Ireland, Ireland's my nation. And then the way that Bloom defines Ireland is, a nation, um, a nation of people living in the same place. And so then um, one of the people in the bar says, and so, and you see for Bloom, that's very inclusive. It's a way of saying, I'm Jewish, but I'm born in Ireland. I live here, I'm Irish. So I'm Irish and Jewish, so I'm part of the Irish nation. And then some very clever people in the bar look at him and say, a people li living in some, one place is a nation. Well then, sure, my family is a nation because we all live in the same house. And <laughs> to which Bloom has to kind of uh, add on to it too. And that's like classic Joycean humor there. But uh, Joyce has to add on, or Bloom has to add on to that too. Well, a nation is people living in the same place and in different places. So he adds that on. But but this figure of the Jew is, is, is interesting for Joyce and he sees a lot of power in it. And the other fun thing about it though, is that um, it's actually Bloom's father who's Jewish. Um, and so he both is and isn't a Jew um, in the kind of matrilineal traditions of Judaism and Jewish identity and community um, that, uh, that, that, that Bloom is left outside of that. And so even as he, like that Bloom claims, look, I'm Jewish um, in this kind of fight in the bar, he also admits later to Stephen, well, I'm not really exactly Jewish because of that matrilineal thing. So that, it's important for Joyce though, like that <clears throat> kind of inclusive gesture there. Um, I see another question here. Joyce has many allusions to other works in Ulysses from epic poetry, operas, novels, his own previous works, and a lot of other notable works. Was he just trying to show off or was he so well read or is there a reason he references so many other works? So, you know, I, I think it's funny, like when Ulysses in a certain sense is the easiest book in the world to teach because you go in and you say, you're gonna hate this. You're gonna think he's an arrogant this or that and you're gonna be frustrated with them. He's, you're gonna think he's a know-it-all and you're just going to be, you're going to be so, oh, you're not going to like him. But so quickly you realize um, that there's such a generosity in Joyce that, um, that I, I don't think it is just him showing off. I mean, he was, he was very well read. He was, he did have this quality of a genius to him in a sense, but he was also just in libraries and taking this and putting it in there and putting it in here, putting it in there. And while on the surface, like your a first reaction to it might be intimidation, Instead, it becomes all these different ways of opening up the text. So say, say for example, like you're a fan of, um, of, uh, of like medieval romance, or you're a fan of Mark Twain, or you're a fan of this or that, you're gonna find that and references to that in Ulysses. And suddenly you're gonna read that section of Ulysses and have so much to say about it and react so well to it um, that it ends up being, it's almost like he has a little something for everybody in there. And so we kind of invite, it, it, it ends up inviting readers in, I think, um, rather than just being a kind of show off thing. But it, but it certainly, I always say, give Joyce a hard time. Like there's no sense, wrestle with him. Like there, you don't have to pay homage to him. Um, but I think that the more that you encounter with him or wrestle with him a bit, that you'll find that it, it's not just show offy. Um, yes, Molly is Jewish. I, that is the case too. And Molly also has kind of a Spanish connection. Um, also music hall and popular culture. I think this is part of what makes it such a playful one. It's so fantastic. And when you meet with people, um, when, you, when you do kind of like the musical exploration through the work, it's fabulous. Like it's so, and if you have like, I was just in a reading group and we had um, someone who is an Irish piper. So he plays the Ilan pipes and knows a lot about Irish popular music and was able to kind of, lead us to links and lead us to um, different moments of song, et cetera, in the work. And it, the, the musical side of Joyce is just so wonderful. Um, and what impacted Joyce's education, training heaven is writing. I recall reading that he still attended Easter mass. Um, I know he wasn't, uh, he wasn't devoutly religious at the end. He may well have still attended mass. Um, he, I, I mean, in a certain sense, like, um, like I also am the product of a Jesuit education and reading Joyce is like realism. So it's like, he, 
he is steeped in um, the Jesuits and kind of Catholicism. And so it's like his, his rejection of Catholicism is an intimate rejection so that like it's still all over the work and he thinks very profoundly about it um, rather than a rejection that would say, well, I'm not even gonna talk about that or think about that. And he goes off in another direction. Um, it is constantly on his mind. It's all over the work. Um, and, uh, and so like, and so I think even in a certain sense, like one could easily be, um, uh, kind of devout, uh, religiously and find Joyce interesting and entertaining. And, and maybe Joyce wrestles with many of the things many people wrestle with and just his ultimate decision is different than one, than a kind of decision that a devout reader might have. Um, but so I, he certainly, he's not simply dismisses, dismissive of Catholicism in a sense. Like he's very, he's very erudite about it and kind of immersed in it. And so um, he does talk about it a lot. Um, if you, so if you would indulge me for a moment, I thought that I would show a couple of kind of fun um, things. So let me, I also saved this part to the end because I'm not the best um, technologically speaking but uh, I think I can do this. Okay, so let me share my screen. All right. All right, can, you, can everyone see this? So this is a lovely photo. This is our Stephen in Paris, coming home from Paris. And one of the things, and so you see there, he has the hat that he has on there is something that they refer to many times in Ulysses. But it's a student hat from the the um, from the Latin Quarter in Paris, and so you see here that Stephen has arrived in Paris and really is dressing the part. That he's so taken with France and taken with like a kind of alternative artist rebel tradition that is very alive in France at this time. Um, so that going back to the middle of the 19th century for the French, uh, figures like Baudelaire, figures like Rimbaud, figures like Berlin, Verlaine, Verlaine um, that you have a real kind of this idea of the artist who is a critic of society and who is a rebel and who has fashion and is noteworthy and noticeable out in public. And here you see Joyce kind of like taking on that kind of flair and bringing it home. Um, so this is like a postcard that he sent back. But I, I think that's just such a fabulous little um, thing. Um, let me see, I think that I can maneuver. Okay, that's not it. I think it's, oh. Okay, this is the next one that I, uh, did the photo shift for you all? Yes. Um, this is the next one. This is um, Joyce uh, in Paris with Sylvia Beach, who's the woman who publishes the work for him. And th it's actually interesting, like Joyce, um, so Joyce, on the one hand, there's the way of thinking about Joyce that is like, he's this singular genius. Um, but Joyce is so connected and collective in the way that he works. So for example, um, as he kind of is writing Ulysses, he's saying, well, look, Ulysses is, if, if Dublin disappeared tomorrow, you could recreate the city, you could rebuild the city from the kind of information that I've detailed here. Um, and I don't know that that's exactly true, but um, it's a fabulous novel in its kind of dedication to, um, to the city of Dublin. So he was writing letters back home to his aunts and saying, if I was on this street and I was the third house in, and I wanted to crawl over the front gate of that house, what would it look like and what would it be? And what is this church that's over there and what building's over there now? And so that like, even as he was um, in Europe and not in Ireland, um, he was writing home constantly to his brother, to his aunts, to his family, finding out these kind of little details about the city so that there would be an exact replication of that in the novel. Um, in the same way, um, Sylvia Beach, the woman who helped get him published, uh, an, a few other kind of um, other kind of important women were kind of reading his work, supporting his work. He made Nora read the work. Uh, Nora, who had no ostensible education uh, that would have made Ulysses an easy read for her. Um, and she had a very kind of powerful dismissive uh, thought about a lot of it. So um, she had a wonderfully kind of, uh, wonderfully kind of dismissive uh, attitude even to Molly saying, why would you? Why would you write? Um, why would you dedicate a whole novel to this? Uh, to this? To this obnoxious woman? She used other kind of terms, but that. But that's uh, what it is. So. So what I was trying to say though is that um, there is that sense of Joyce as singular, 
But Joyce made a lot of his writing very collective. Um, and he was asking people, showing people, looking for reactions, getting their input. He didn't always follow it, but, but just, I think any of us know when you're working on a project, there's a difference between a project that we let other people help us out with versus a project that we just do on our own. And Joyce was very much a um, one, he let other people help him out. Um, this then is Nora when they first meet. And I think there you see Nora's from the West of Ireland. Um, she's, I mean, the West of Ireland, they can be wild people. They're fabulous. Like she's from Galway. Um, and there is a bit of a sense in the West of the wild West of the English never quite made it here. The English never quite ran everything. Um, and so there is a kind of independence and um, sense of self that exists in the West, I think even to this day. Um, and so you see a little bit of that in Nora, but certainly you see also the country girl. You see, this is, this is the country girl from the West of Ireland, um, not here she is, look how fabulous she looks. Um, but here's Nora, this is many years later. And there you see, I mean, look at the kind of confidence in, the, in her look there and the confidence in herself. And you just can imagine a James Joyce writing this stuff and daring to show it to her. Um, and that she's gone from that kind of shy country girl, maybe not so shy from, from what we're told about their first day out, um, but she's gone from that kind of country girl uh, to this woman that seems just very formidable. And here, here's another image from that. But look at her there. I mean, look at, look at her, that she's, she's gone from this kind of country girl to this woman living in Europe and she's used to the paparazzi and she has this fabulous outfit on and her, her kind of 1920s hat that's all the rage and all the fashion. And she knows her role and what's going on here. I think that's just such kind of a fabulous thing there. Um, let's see if there's other, wait, I'm gonna stop sharing for one second. Um, are there any other questions or I'm happy to chatter on about um, anything. And I also thought um, we have like about five minutes left. Um, I, I was going to give us um, some audio, uh, but, and I'm thinking maybe since I ended with the, the images of Nora, um, maybe we should end with some audio from Molly's monologue at the end of it. Um, I see uh, some excited heads shaking their heads. Yes, there. Okay, wait one second. Let me set this up. Okay. Patrick, just so you know, in, there was another question that came into the chat that was, to what extent was Joyce's work circulated in Dublin in 1916? Um, so, a lot of his work, I, I'm, you know what, I, uh, he had trouble getting his work out in Ireland. Um, and I have to say, I'm bad at, I, I'm not quite sure about that. So um, I don't, I just don't want to misspeak and, and sort of say the wrong thing. Um, but Ireland was a difficult place for him to get his work out, um, given the kind of um, uh, quality, kind of, kind of, revolutionary quality of it. Um, okay, let me now share the screen again. All right. All right, I'm going to play just like the last couple minutes. Um, let me know if the sound is on. Eat on the foul market, all can people hear outside it? Lobby Sharon's, and the poor donkeys slipping half asleep, and the vague fellows in the cloaks asleep in the shade and the steps, and the big wheels of the carts of the bulls, and the old castle thousands of years old. Yes, and those handsome moors all in white, and turbans like kings, asking her to sit down in the little bit of a shop, and Rhonda with the old windows of the posadas, glancing eyes a lattice hid for her lover to kiss, the iron and the wine shops half open at night, and the castanets, and the night we missed the boat at Algeciris, the watchman going about serene with his lamp, 
and oh that awful deep down torrent oh and the sea the sea crimson sometimes like fire the glorious sunsets and the fig trees in the alameda gardens yes and all the queer little streets and pink and blue and yellow houses and the rose gardens and the jessamine and the geraniums and cactuses and gibraltar as a girl when i was a flower of the mountain yes when i put the rose in my hair like the andalusian girls used or shall i wear red yes and how he kissed me under the moorish wall and i thought well as well him as another and then i asked him with my eyes to ask again yes and then he asked me would i yes to say yes my mountain flower and first i put my arms around him yes and drew him down to me so he could feel my breast all perfume yes and his heart was going like mad yes i said yes i will yes all right. And so that's that's Molly at the end of her monologue, remembering back to kind of her early sexual experiences, her early experiences with um, Bloom, and also just confirming that she loves Bloom. Um, but I think there you get a little bit of the flavor of, um, and there's all sorts of debates around how feminist was Joyce or how feminist wasn't he. But imagine just a uh, hundred years ago, a writer willing to end a novel, a male writer willing to end a novel with the woman's voice deciding what she wants and that she's owning that kind of moment for herself. And it's just, it, the, and I think reading the Molly monologue is a bit difficult sometimes, but listening to it in the, um, sec, in the kind of uh, version that I put in the chat for you, um, it's fabulous. Like it's just, I would really, if you, if you want like a full taste of, um, of Nora, of what Joyce was thinking about, Nora thinking about him, about everything, I think it's a kind of great place to start. You could even start there and then go back and, and find out about Bloom and Stephen. Is there um, a reference version of Ulysses with notes to Beth? You know what, um, Ed, that's an excellent question. Um, a friend of mine, um, Catherine Flynn, is actually with, uh, you, it, you can either go through the stuff that I've sent today um, and start out, but um, it's going to be released for 19, the centenary next year. Cambridge is coming out with a reader friendly edition that is going to include all sorts of notes and aids and summaries. And she said even like a, a list of characters and who they are and what role they play and that kind of thing. In, in a certain sense, like um, the first time you read Ulysses, if anyone's in, interested in, in reading Ulysses, um, the first time you read it, you're really reading it to be able to go back and reread it. And actually my, my students this semester, when we finished, they got all excited and they said, let's reread it this summer. And when I finally sent out the, uh, the message to set up a time to reread it together, summer had set in and they said, well, yeah, maybe we thought that a couple of weeks ago, but let's do it next year. But um, no, so you, you really do read it um, to read it this, the next time. Because once you have the general kind of sense of it, your general experience of it, then you can go back to the parts that you missed, spend more time on things, dive in and out of it. It's kind of like a whole kind of universe that you're able to play with. Um, so I would sort of suggest that, um, that give it a go your first time, but don't, don't expect that you'll get all of it. And you've kind of opened a world to yourself that you get to visit and, and, and then reading stuff about Ulysses, even if you're not, if you think you're not getting what Ulysses is, even reading stuff about it, you'll feel fantastically smart because they'll make references to things that you'll think, oh, I know that, or I know this. And it, the criticism about Ulysses is so understandable. You suddenly feel like the world's brightest philosopher. You'll love it. So it's, it's a great kind of thing. You're welcome very much. Thank you all for having me. I don't know if you wanted to say any final things. Or... Yeah, no, I just want to say thank you again, uh, Professor Mullen. It was a really great uh, talk, and I hope everyone learned a little bit uh, from the conversation. Um, again, I just want to let everyone know this recording uh, will be up on our YouTube channel, uh, and you'll also be receiving a survey from the alumni office. It always really helps for us to kind of hear from our alumni about how our programming is going, so we can kind of move things forward and get uh, novel ideas like this for a great program. Uh, we had a really great show in the people, so. We always love hearing from you about different programs that you'd like to hear. So thank you again. Uh, have a great summer, everyone. And we'll hopefully see more, more of you over the summertime.